never be afraid. There's nothing which is known which can't be understood. And there's nothing which is understood which can't be explained. For over 50 episodes now, my team and I have brought you to the very frontier of knowledge in physics and astronomy. And still, our mission goes on. To present you with your birthright, an understanding of the universe. I've traveled the world seeking out a certain type of genius. Masters of not only their academic disciplines, but also at explaining their research in understandable ways. And I've bestowed upon these women and men the title of Titanium Physicist. You're listening to the Titanium Physicist Podcast, and I'm Ben Tippett. And now, L.A. Physique! Physicists are famous for quips, or rather, I should say, among physicists, some events are remembered in terms of a physicist who was there at the time who said something quippy. You probably haven't heard most of them, but you are surely familiar with a few of them. On the advent of our interpreting quantum mechanics, Albert Einstein was corresponding with Max Born and famously quipped that the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics was surely wrong because, quote, God does not play dice. Or, when the first atomic bomb was tested in 1945 in New Mexico, the theoretical physicist and director of the Manhattan Project, J. Robert Oppenheimer, was awed at the power his efforts had placed into our hands. And he quoted from the Bhagavad Gita. He said, Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. One of my favorite quips is from the advent of modern particle physics. Back in the early 1930s, we thought that we had all the particles figured out. Now, the story is a little different than the one you learnt in high school because of quantum mechanics, but the actors are all still the same. Everything was made out of three elementary particles. There's a proton and a neutron, and they live together inside of a nucleus, and then there are electrons who live outside, running around like a dog in the yard. At this time, we figured that that was all there was. Some theoretical work had been done on the possibility of other short-lived particles that might have to do with radioactive decay, but no one had ever seen them. And in the mid-1930s, we detected something new. A new particle, different from the other three. Different in character, just different. We called it a muon. And it upset the apple cart. In this context, this world-changing context, where suddenly everything we knew about matter in the universe suddenly became superficial, and we were forced to consider new depths of possibility, Isidore Isaac Rabi, and he will be known forever for having said it, he said, Who ordered that? Like everyone was sitting around, eating takeout Chinese food, and there was an extra container of rice. Who ordered that? I'm not sure if it's a privilege to live in an era of great discovery. Like, maybe discovery is the wrong word. Muons weren't discovered the way the secret to making gunpowder or ice cream were discovered. They were always around us, just unrecognized. I can only wonder at whether these particle physicists felt the floor falling out from under them as they discovered that the story was much, much more complicated and harder to understand than they had always assumed. People are emotionally invested in things that they think are certain. But what's a person to do? The same thing you've always done. You don't turn your back on the truth, and you do good work. Seek reliable data. Seek reliable explanations. Build a new standard model. Teach yourself. Teach your students. Move forward. In the 80 years which followed, we discovered a whole new system of fundamental particles. Six quarks, six antiquarks, six types of leptons, and six antileptons, and force-carrying bosons as well. The muon was just the tip of the iceberg, but the muon was the first. 
Who ordered that indeed? Today on the Titanium Physicist Podcast, we're going to talk about the particle that upset the apple cart, the stablest of the unstable particles, the sibling of the electron. It's the muon. And our guest today has become a renowned author in recent years, publishing essays and short stories in all manner of publication from the Drabblecast to Mashable to the Boston Globe. But her ambitious prose came to my attention with a debut novella called River of Teeth, an alternate history story about bloodthirsty feral hippo hippopotami wandering the Mississippi and the people hired to hunt them. It's available now on Amazon for pre-order. Welcome to the show, Sarah Gailey. Hi! <laughs> Hi! So, Sarah, for you, I've assembled two old friends. Arise, Ryan Martin. Plop, plop. Dr. Ryan did his PhD at Queen's University, and then after a postdoc at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, he is currently an assistant professor in the physics department at Queen's University, where he studies neutrinos. Now arise, Diana Cowern. Woo, yeah! <laughs> Diana Cowern is one of the world's leading physics communicators. She did her physics undergraduate degree at MIT, and you probably know her better as the host of the very popular Physics Girl YouTube channel. All right, everybody, let's talk about muons. Muons! Yeah, so the, the first bit about a muon is, like, what is a muon? Ben gave that wonderful introduction and, and gave the muon the glory it deserves yeah muon is it's a it's a, a very small particle so it's it's like an electron or a, a, a proton you know the sense that a, that they are all particles but it is more like an electron in the sense that it's um what's known as an elementary or a fundamental particle that means that like as far as we know it is like the bottom. It's the base. It's not made up of anything else. It is fundamental. It, it has a, a negative charge. So back in the middle school, when you learn about you know negative charge and positive charge, like the electron has negative charge, proton has positive charge, and they attract and so forth. Um, the muon has a negative charge. So it's it's very much like an electron it has a negative charge. It's a fundamental particle like an electron, but it is much more massive it's like really heavy compared to an electron hang on i thought you said it was small it is very small it is massive oh it's like dense okay yeah that's a great question because the answer yes would be intuitively correct but uh, electrons and muons are both point-like particles and that means that all of their mass instead of being distributed over a, an object with volume, like a cannonball, right? You can say this cannonball is heavier than this softball because it's made of denser material, right? Um, well, in this case, all of the mass is concentrated to a single point in both the electron and the muon. And so the mass is fundamental. Uh, every muon has the same amount of mass and uh, that mass doesn't come from it being made of anything else. So like some things, uh, like protons, protons are made of other things. So when you're in elementary school, you learn that protons and neutrons are fundamental, right? Yes, I'll but go with that. They're they're not. They're made of other things. If you take a beam of like electrons or some other probing particle and you shoot them at a proton fast enough like to do. like get in there and really mm -hmm. probe the inner structure, you see that the inside of every proton are three of something. And you don't know what they are. It turns out they're quarks. It's just there's another basement to the uh, fundamental particle thing when it comes to protons and neutrons. They're made of a smaller fundamental particle. Right. As in all things, my elementary school teachers <laughs> lied to me. Well, they didn't lie to you about the electron. The electron is a fundamental particle. It's not made of anything else. Uh, and neither is the muon. In fact, the, the electron and the muon share a lot of things. They spin the same way. They have the same electric charge. You know, in terms of mathematics, they're very similar, except for the difference that the muon is very heavy. It's got a lot of mass, where it's 200 times, give or take, 207-ish times heavier than an electron. So it's much more massive in spite of the fact that, one, it's point-like, so we can't talk about its density. We can't attribute that increase in mass to anything else. And two, uh, it looks electrony. Yeah, I just want to, I want to add in there, like, Sarah, when you said it's dense, I was like, that is such a good word. But then you broke me as a physicist because <laughs> I like, I froze like a, <laughs> like a cat that has a brain freeze. Because I was thinking like, 
yes, it like has a lot of mass in a very small volume. Like, so that is the definition of dense. But like Ben said, it's a point particle. It doesn't have a volume as far as we know. It's so small as to not even take up any space, but yet it has mass. Oh my God, (laughs) such is the weirdness of particles. I'm so proud of myself. I make it a point of pride to try and break one physicist every day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I was worried that I wasn't going to manage to fit it in today with my very busy schedule, but I still pulled through. Congratulations. I'm happy to be the one you broke on this Wednesday evening. So there's a cartoon explanation of a mass, right? So I'll just sketch it out. <laughs> the Higgs boson, this famous thing that's always in the news, uh, at least if you're a physicist, it tries to explain how the particles have different masses. And the way the picture mass is how much the various particles like to interact with this Higgs boson, which is another particle. And so the cartoonish explanation is if you imagine a person is trying to cross a room, uh, so it's a, you have a party and you have a bunch of people in the room and the, the person wants to cross the room. So maybe the first person that comes in is a physicist. They're not very popular. It's very easy for them to cross the room because nobody stops to talk to them. The next person that comes in is a muon. They're very popular. And so they try to cross the room, but every time they take a step, more people want to talk to them. So it takes them a long time to cross the room because they're so popular. All these people want to talk to them. So even though the two people are the same size, they both have different affinities for other people or for Higgs bosons. And that's sort of what the the mass is. And so um, the muon and the electron are both infinitely small, but the muon is more massive. So That mass is felt as its desire to interact with the Higgs bosons that are um, everywhere through space. Would be a cartoonish way to explain it. The muon is like the beginning of a world of particle physics, where most people you learn about protons and electrons and neutrons at some point in their science classes, and then that's it. That's like that's what all matter is made of. That's all you need to know. But there's like all these other particles, so many different kinds of particles, and muons were one of the first ones discovered besides protons and neutrons and electrons. So like muons were super exciting for physicists because they were like, oh my God, this whole world is opening up into other kinds of particles, maybe other kinds of matter, maybe other kinds of, you know, things that we've never, ever seen before. And muons were one of the first discovered. So here's my confusion is I was under the impression that science was completely static and we had discovered everything that we were ever going to discover and will ever discover as of like 1934. Well, who told you that? In fact, that, that was before they discovered a muon. Yeah. We're literally on the yeah. cusp of... Do you mean to tell me that there's more yes. science? Surely not. I love that you picked 1934 because it's like right before muons were discovered. <laughs> I don't even have the Muon Wikipedia page open. I should do that so that I can say more clever things, but I'm not going to. Okay. So to summarize, muons are like electrons. They're essentially the same thing, except for a a few key differences. One of them is how much more mass it has. Uh, And Ryan says that the reason they have more mass is because uh, they interact with the Higgs field in a little bit different way. So the Higgs field is this field that they discovered that's there to kind of explain why things like electrons have different amounts of mass than things like muons. And so the deal is that muons hug Higgs fields more than... I'm sorry, did you say that they yeah. hug the Yeah, Higgs sure. Field? They they interact with it more. They couple to it more. They stick to it more. No, that's so friendly. Like, they're just hugging. They're all best friends, just comforting each other they, through hard that's times. Right. That's nice. That's nice. I like it. They have more inertia. As a result of this. Okay, so uh, there's another big way that they're not like electrons. Because if they were like electrons in every way, to be honest, we would see them everywhere. Like, we detected electrons. Why did it take until 1930-ish for us to detect muons? And the reason is because muons fall apart. That's not quite the right word. They don't fall apart because they're not made of anything. But they're what's called in the particle physics community unstable, which means that they fall apart. They fall apart in like the emotional way. They just have a lot going on right now and they need some space (laughs) and they just need you to understand that they might have to cancel on you last minute because like things are intense and sometimes they need to take a night for themselves. New ones are a little flaky. Exactly. Okay. Uh, And sometimes they just spontaneously turn into a bunch of other particles and then they stop being muons and they start being 
electrons and neutrinos. I mean, doesn't that happen to us all from time to time? It doesn't to happen time? to electrons or neutrinos. They mostly stay electrons and neutrinos. So they feel that refuse to change. We, it's like how everybody eventually turns into a very uh, angry old person who refuses to change. Okay. The deal is that there's just kind of an echelon of different particles. The idea is that once the muon changes into a bunch of neutrinos and electron, they kind of go their own separate way and they won't turn back into a muon. So, you know, muons get generated in our atmosphere. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But essentially, that's what they first detected muons in that circumstance. And they get created. They last quite a while for a particle. Their mean lifetime is something like two microseconds, which in particle terms is forever. So they, they stick around for two microseconds. And then on average, they'll just spontaneously turn into a, a bunch of electrons and tiny little neutrinos. And that's why we don't see them everywhere, because all the ones that were muons have in that time turned into electrons. Can one of you tell me what fraction of a second a microsecond is? One millionth. Okay, so yeah, so that's a super know, long time. Just like two of those? <sighs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> Not okay. one, but two. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to me that there are particles that decay so much faster than two millionths of a second. And like in particle world, two millionths of a second is a really long time. What about the decay time of, of a, an electron or a proton? Do those decay ever? Oh, that's an interesting question, actually. The decay of a proton says that on the other scale of things, is there's a lot of experiments trying to see if protons do decay. Mm. Um, that's like one of the big holy grails of particle physics is to observe a proton decay. So they have these very large experiments where they have a lot of protons and they just look at them for years. Oh my guess. <laughs> well, if they don't decay, like if, if a proton is really, really stable and they never decay, then that is the longest, most boring experiment ever possibly conducted. Yeah, except that those experiments have fortuitously discovered other things. Mm. There was a series of proton decay experiments in the 80s that were, they had a lot of protons by just having a large amount of water. Any matter has protons in it, really. And while they were observing this water, looking for a little flash of light from a proton decay, uh, all of a sudden, several of these experiments around the world saw multiple flashes of light all at the same time. And it turns out that all those flashes of light were from neutrinos, a different particle, coming from a supernova in a different galaxy. So they were trying to observe proton decay, and sort of serendipitously, they effectively made a telescope to look in a different galaxy and to see a star explode. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's always how physics goes. There you go, Sarah. So oh, there has been physics done since the 30s. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, so there's also, there's a whole spectrum, right? So the things like the proton, they might never decay. What about the electron? Uh, I don't think the electron decays either. Neutrons decay actually pretty quickly. The average neutron that's outside of a nucleus will turn into other particles in, in about 14 minutes. Sarah, I have a question. Is decay anything confusing to you or boring to you? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And as a horror writer, I am a huge fan of all forms of decay. Ooh, I see. Yeah, I feel like physicists love to commandeer words and use them in a very specific way. Like decay as rotting flesh <laughs> is very different from decay as a particle. Well, I just picture the particle kind of shambling along and limbs are falling off and then it's turning into a skeleton and then that's falling apart and that's kind of the mental image that I work with which is way yeah. more fun than any other one where like you know you're just turning into an isotope. That's great because it's an interesting contrast. You were like hey when I imagine decay I imagine something falling apart and turning into uh, bones and globs of meat and stuff right? Um, in some sense, when, when we're talking yeah, about okay. things decaying, we're taught, we're imagining that, uh, they're turning into their constituent parts. So instead of being meat on a bone, it's now a skeleton without any meat on it. And then the meat's somewhere else. Right. Right. Yeah. So, um, that's not how particle physics works. And it's not how particle physics works in a really interesting way. 
You can make particles out of other particles. It's like a zombie decays into a vampire. (laughs) Okay. We need to have a conversation about zombies and vampires on my podcast. It's like a zombie decays into a small vampire and also uh, two, I don't know, wolfmen? Yeah. Baby werewolves. Yeah, two baby werewolves. (laughs) You guys have got your hierarchy of monsters all wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, we're physicists, okay? <laughs> the thing about particle physics is that the processes that happen are entirely statistical. Uh, there is some probability that something will turn into something else. And uh, there are conservation laws at play that dictate what things can turn into other things. So, for instance, we talked about how neutrons decay. If a neutron decays, it's going to turn into uh, a proton and an electron, right? Because one has positive charge, the other has negative charge. And so when you mash them together, those charges cancel out and you get a neutrally charged particle. And also you get a neutrino. But it's not that an electron and a proton are the constituent parts of a neutron. Neutrons are their own thing. It's just that statistically speaking... All of the component parts of a neutron can exchange themselves, turn themselves into a new configuration of matter. And that new configuration of matter will be a proton and an electron. And so you can make a neutron by essentially shooting a proton and an electron together if you shoot them together with enough energy. The idea here is that there are certain conservation laws that are conserved in any of these processes. But beyond then, what the energy turns into is a matter of statistics. So the the deal is that with a certain amount of energy, you can have one electron moving at a certain speed, one proton moving at a certain speed, and one neutrino, which is another type of particle moving at a certain speed. Or you can have, take that same amount of energy, that same amount of electric charge, and exchange them in for a neutron. And so the idea is that uh, neutrons can turn into this combination of other particles. But it's not that the neutron is made of this combination of other particles. It's just that this collection of particles can randomly change into, if you smash them together, a neutron. And a neutron can randomly change back into this collection of particles. Okay, that's a fantastic explanation. And I love it. I was more talking about just my enjoyment, as we were saying earlier, of the way that physics tends to take words and turn them into a a physics thing. Yeah, that's right. So what I'm trying to to contrast here is just how close to the word decay in the natural sense, which usually means breaks down into some component parts, particle decay is. But in this case, particles aren't composed of the particles that they break down into. It's kind of a statistical process. If the energy density in one place is high enough and you can make I don't know. It's kind of like changing a $5 bill into a bunch of coins and other dollar bills, a $2 bill and five loonies or let's see a toonie. No. Okay. Wait, if like what particles do they have in Canada? They have uh loonies and no, 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 not what coinage, what particles. Cause if I was going to go across the Canadian border with some uh-huh. neutrons, I assume that they would transition into something completely different. The exchange rate these days in neutrons is about parity. So good one. (laughs) Okay. So the moral of the story is back to muons. Muons decay. Eventually they stop being muons. And the deal is that muons are point like they have no constituent parts. They're just there at a point. So when they decay, it's not that they fall apart It's that all of a sudden that muon just randomly rolls the dice and exchanges all of its energy into other smaller particles with less mass energy. So neutrinos and electrons. And then those guys all tear off in different directions. And so because they're not all in the same place anymore, they can't change back into a muon. Now, I do want to take a moment to appreciate the fact that you said muons eventually change when we're talking about two microseconds. Oh yeah, that's forever. I don't feel like the word eventually applies. So there's an interesting thing here about muons turning into electrons, which is that in particle physics, you know how I said like there are some conservation laws, like conservation of electric charge or conservation of total energy that um, determine what things can turn into other things? Yeah. 
the the idea here is that we have experimentally discovered a type of conservation law. It, it says that there's essentially this type of charge. It's not like an electric charge, but it's conserved like an electric charge called lepton number or, or flavor that says essentially that if you have a box and there's one electron in it, then that box has one unit of electron flavor floating around somewhere in there. And that electron flavor can exist in a few different forms. It can be one electron worth of electron flavor, or it can be one neutrino worth of electron flavor. The electron has kind of two different siblings. There's the muon, which we're talking about today, and one that's much heavier than both of them called the tau, or the tauon. Okay, so enough with the Greek alphabet physics. Oh man, let me tell you, particle physics is crazy about the Greek <laughs> alphabet. There's things called pions, <laughs> and alphabet things called upsilons, oh, scions. Yeah. Scions a good there are one. There alphabets. There's more of them. What, what, than Greek? Don't you like Greek? I mean, I'm fine with Greek, but like, try something else every now and again. There's so many other alphabets. It's better Greek letters, I think, than like colors or whatever, and then calling them charm and <laughs> truth and beauty. <laughs> truth and beauty. <laughs> so there are three different flavors: uh, muon, tauon, and uh, electron. And the deal is that any type of interaction that happens, you need to conserve the quantity of electronness or muonness. And what that means is, if you are going to turn a muon into an electron, you need to take into account the fact that the flavors don't match. So what you need to do is you need to add two more particles to the mix. For a muon to turn into something, it needs another particle to carry away its muonness. So Aww. it loses a mu neutrino. And then if the thing's going to turn into an electron, if you're going to make an electron, you need something to carry away the hole that that electron is left behind. And so you need a, an anti-electron neutrino. You need a rebound particle. Yeah, you need kind of a, it's kind of a shadow particle. It shows up to, to cover the fact that uh, your has no electronness. I mean, we've all been there, right? Like, I mean, you lose your electronness and then you just need some particle to like fill that gap for a short time until you feel like yourself again. <laughs> Uh, when the muon decays, it turns into one muon neutrino, so that's where its muonness went, and then an electron and an anti electron neutrino, because their total electronness is zero. There's an electron that's plus one, and an anti electron charge minus one. The total is zero. The moral of the story is if your muon's going to decay, it's going to decay into three particles, and that's super weird, but you end up with a ton of uh, neutrinos. Hey, lepton charge, everybody. Isn't it crazy? Yay! Well, actually, yeah, you have to conserve lepton flavor and the total number of leptons. So there's three things that are conserved. There's electric charge, because you have the muon changes into an electron, and the two neutrinos have no charge. So there you've conserved the negative charge. You've conserved the electronness and the muonness, right? So first you have an, one muonness, then you have an electron and an anti electron neutrino, so that's no electronness, and you have a muon neutrino, which is one muonness. And then finally, you also have to conserve the total number of leptons. So you have one electron, that's one, plus one muon neutrino, that's two, minus one anti neutrino. There's two involving leptons? Yeah. But then the weird thing, we already know the lepton flavor, the muonness and the electronness, is not conserved because we've observed the neutrinos can change from one type to the other. Yeah. So an electron flavor neutrino can just change into a muon flavor neutrino and back and forth and back and forth. Okay. So, Sarah, are you particularly satisfied with muons? Do you feel like you know what they are? I'm going to say I know what they are as much as I know what anything is. And who among us can say that we truly know? anything at all. I love that answer. That's <laughs> amazing. It's true. Like muons are really random particles that most people have never heard of, but like there's some really cool applications of muons. So they're not just useless particles. Okay, so what are some of the applications? Oh yeah. Let's talk about cosmic rays. Let's just talk about the interesting thing. Radiation from space. As in outer space? Yeah, yeah. So this was actually the first place that 
muons were detected. Um, and people have been trying to measure it for a while. Um, do you remember when the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider, got turned on and everybody was obsessed about black holes being created? And by everyone, I mean crazy people in the media. Does that ring a bell? People were like, oh, no, it's going to make a black hole and kill us all. Do you remember that? Of course. Okay, so physicists, when uh, addressed this problem, literally said the physicistiest thing of all, which is, I don't know, maybe. But they didn't seem particularly concerned about it as a possibility. And the reason we weren't worried about accidentally creating a black hole that would kill us all is because as strong as the Large Hadron Collider is, it is nowhere near as energetic as various particles hitting the Earth's atmosphere from space. It's called cosmic rays. This is a phenomenon where it's a weird, even distribution. It happens all over the Earth. Nobody's quite sure about where it comes from, but they're like, they're little nucleus of atoms, and they're moving super, 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 super fast. And when they hit the Earth's atmosphere, you know, as soon as they hit an air atom, that collision is so energetic that it has the capacity to generate any particle. It's more energetic than any Earth-based particle accelerator. So the reason physicists weren't particularly worried about a black hole is because literally this type of particle collision has been happening in our atmosphere since the dawn of time, and it has not killed us yet. So there's nothing we could do at CERN which would pose any risk at all. When you say that there's nothing we could do at CERN, is there nothing we could do, period, including various political events that would cause a black hole that would destroy the earth. <laughs> like even if we deserved it a lot. Oh, we do deserve it, but it hasn't <laughs> happened yet. So yeah. So that is one of the big questions is uh what is making these cosmic rays, these super 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 highly energetic particles that are coming from somewhere in the universe. We have some ideas, maybe exploding stars or big black holes, accelerating gases and things like that. Uh, but we really don't know. And these super, super, super high energy atoms, when they hit our atmosphere, they basically have zero chance of making it to the surface of the Earth. Instead, what they do is they make these big collisions. And ultimately, one of the particles that comes out the most is the muon. In fact, the muon, because it has such a long lifetime of a whole two microseconds, is one of the only particles that makes it down to the Earth's surface. All the other particles that are created, and there's many, um, they have way shorter half-lives. They decay way faster than the muons, and so they stay up in the atmosphere. So we try to understand the cosmic rays that are coming into the atmosphere in several ways, and the easiest way is to try and study the muons that come out of it and try to understand the size of the shower that you get and things like that. So the first muons that we discovered were these cosmic ray muons. So we also know how to make muons in the lab, but the first ones that we discovered, because they're so readily accessible, are the muons that come from cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere. To give you an idea, you get one muon per minute per square centimeter. So that's how many are coming down right now through the roof of your house, bombarding you. Uh, that's what that, okay, I was kind of wondering. So when you feel but, that tingle sometimes, it's just the muon passing through. Well, it's, it's, pro <laughs> it's like a thousand muons coming through, right? Well, one per, per square centimeter per minute. Wait, why is it per square centimeter instead of per cubic centimeter? Uh, the reason we use a square centimeter instead of a cubic centimeter is because we kind of picture it as uh, here's a surface, how many are going through the surface? And so then the units of surface are square centimeters. So it's kind of like you hold up a tennis racket and you count how many are going through the tennis racket. Yeah. So there's a variety of experiments to look for these muons and other stuff that comes from the cosmic rays. Uh, one that's pretty cool is in Argentina. It's called the Pierre Auger Observatory. They have essentially a bunch of bathtubs scattered around the desert. Each one of these bathtubs has water in it. And then they have very sensitive cameras looking at the water. The water is uh, it's in a little uh, tank, so it's shielded. So, I mean, there's no light. And so what they do is they have all these tanks and they wait for muons to go through the water, and when the muon goes through the water, it makes a very faint amount of light that the, the cameras pick up. And so they scattered thousands of these bathtubs across the desert in Argentina, and then they look every time that there's light in several bathtubs, they infer that 
if those blips of light in multiple bathtubs all happen at the same time, those must all come from a shower of muons from a cosmic ray uh, that hit the atmosphere. The array of bathtubs covers many square kilometers or square miles in the U.S., and then they count how many bathtubs went off, and that gives you an idea of how much energy the original cosmic ray had. Because the more energy the cosmic ray had, the more muons it produces when it hits the atmosphere, and then the more bathtubs you'll see light up. Neat. The picture here is that we're getting one particle hits the upper atmosphere, and it hits it, and it generates a whole bunch of weird other particles that are really short-lived, like fireworks. And each of those has so much energy that when they hit something else or maybe they decay on their own, they'll turn into a small shower of other particles. And so you get this cascade, literally like those fireworks that where they blow up and then their tips blow up. That's literally what's happening, only it's coming down towards us. And so what starts out as a single particle turns into a whole shower of muons all moving in the same direction. And so what we're doing is we're not just detecting a single muon or a couple. We detect a whole glob of them moving past us. And we say, ah, that big glob, that is caused by a single cosmic ray. And we can calculate how much energy the cosmic ray had based on adding up all of the energy from all these different muons. Exactly. So I just looked up the size of this array. It's 50 miles by 50 miles. And the bathtubs are like a mile apart. That is crazy. (laughs) So like one bathtub per square mile. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Can can I just like mention relativity real fast? So Sarah, I just want to tell you that the first time I heard about muons was actually in high school and I didn't really care about them as muons yet. But I was taking a class in relativity, which a lot of people don't take in their lifetimes. So I was really lucky that I had a teacher who was super into physics and taught us at least conceptually about relativity and some of the crazy things like time moves at a different rate when you're going really fast and the length of things gets shorter when you're going really fast and and crazy things like that. So the reason why I first learned about muons and why my teacher brought them up is that muons are supposed to decay in this two microseconds that we've talked about over and over, um, which means that they should not be able to make it from the top of the atmosphere down to Earth where we detect them. They should decay before that. They're not going fast enough to make it down in that amount of time. They should decay to something else. But they don't. We do detect them. We do see a bunch of muons, which indicate that maybe they're living longer, but we know how long they live. So what's going on? And what we ended up realizing was that this is an indicator that time moves differently for things that are moving really fast. So time stretches out such that the muons can make it from the top of the atmosphere to the bottom. And it seems like it's a longer amount of time for us but it's moving slower for the muons. And so I was learning about muons in the context of of relativity, this like weird fact that time changes speed when you're moving and these muons are moving very quickly. So their time goes at a different rate and they're able to make it down. So this muon thing is, is totally crazy because cosmic rays among their mysteries is that they hit everywhere on earth with pretty close regularity. There's some issues there with magnetic fields. Uh, they hit some parts of the earth more than others, but it's a pretty reliable rain in so far as they tried to figure out once upon a time where they were all coming from. They said, Hey, are all these particles coming from Jupiter? And then so they would look at this data to see where all these different all over the world particles are coming from. Are they all pointing towards Jupiter? No, they were just pointed in random directions in the sky. There's no rhyme or reason to how or why or when they fall. But the result is that they're actually pretty reliable. Oh, Diana, tell us about tomography. (laughs) Nothing would make me happier. So muons can pass through things and eventually, you know, hit some things, but they go through, obviously they go through a lot of our atmosphere and are not scattered as much as some types of light, like, like x-rays. So what we can do with muons is look into things that we can't otherwise look into. For example, some of the the most interesting examples to me are um, looking into the pyramids. So we can like look through the walls of the pyramids and see what's inside. What? No, you can't. Oh, yeah, yeah. yes, you can. This has been done. Yeah. this is. So it's kind of like an x-ray, right? Like you send 
an x-ray through your body and some of it gets absorbed and some of it is scattered and you get this image on your detector on the other side. Like that's kind of the idea with muon tomography, uh, which is a word that I don't use very often. Tomography? Tomography, yeah. Like topography, which is like the imaging of the surface of something kind of, but instead you're mapping the inside what what okay. this is called like the cross section like slices of it you can look inside and see mm-hmm. you know like you see inside your body you can see your bones inside so physicists used muon tomography to image the destruction of, of the core of the fukushima nuclear plant after it exploded because you kind of want to understand the damage that has been done and what the aftermath of that explosion looks like to be able to deal with dangerous nuclear materials. Good job, muons. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. So they used muons and they imaged the core in, I believe this was in 2015, to try and understand where the core was, where the debris was, what it looked like inside, and and get a sense for how they were going to deal with the dangerous nuclear materials. You can also look in cargo ships. You can look for explosives. You can, you know, yeah, it's one of the coolest things about muon tomography that you can look into things and you can image inside. Like, you you don't have to actually go and cut something up. You can look inside. And in a better way, in some senses, than x-rays because they can travel farther into a material than x-rays and other types of radiation can. Yeah. When they try to shoot electrons through things, for the most part, they just kind of bounce off because they're very, very, very light compared to, say, the nucleuses of things. But muons, they're so much heavier than electrons that when they try to pass through material, they just kind of go through like a a truck through a field of corn. So gracefully and without being noticed. Yeah. So it's great because the source for the muons in these cases is often cosmic rays. These cosmic rays are just raining down on us and we're saying, hey, let's say I want to see inside that volcano. I don't know when it's going to erupt. I need to know where the lava inside of it is. You can set up a a muon detector on the bottom side of the volcano and you can aim it and try to specifically detect the muons that are kind of falling through the sky diagonally. And if they pass through the volcano, then some parts of the volcano with the rockier parts will absorb more muons than the parts with the lava or something. And you can you can interpret the signals you get on the other side and deduce from those. It's just like an x-ray, just like Diana said. I have a correction. It was actually in the 1960s the first time that uh, they used muon tomography for the, um, to look in the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza. Because he was looking for uh, hidden chambers. Uh, it was an unsuccessful experiment was, at that what? time. What? It was unsuccessful? It was Louis Alvarez who did it. And he was from the Bay Area. Because I remember going to Louis Alvarez something something. Woo! The first experiment was when they were they had a mine shaft. And they wanted to know how much rock was yeah. above the mine shaft. And so they, they set up a muon detector under it and said, Well, we know vaguely at what rate muons are hitting the That's earth right. above us. And they deduced information about the rocks above it. Yeah. So it's a it's a valid way of testing, and you can do all sorts of fun things with it. So they had the idea a long time ago, which is pretty cool. Because you think in the 60s, it was a rather incomplete picture that they had. Yeah, I mean, in order to do this, you have to know, like we were talking about how many muons are going through your body per yep. minute. You have yep. to know that pretty accurately in order to look at the other side and be like, this is how many muons pass. So therefore, this must be what is in between the atmosphere and my muon detector. You have to take a lot of things into account, right? So what you're really doing is you're looking at the muons that are coming at all different angles. So muons that come from straight above, the distance between the top of the atmosphere and you is shorter than the muons that are kind of skimming the earth, basically. And so you have to take into account when you do that, that the muons who have traveled longer have also had more time to decay. So you have to correct for that before you can even do the tomography. So it's pretty cool that they thought of all that quite a while ago. Muons are... I'm awesome. They're amazing. Okay, for each of you, what is your favorite thing about muons? If you had to choose one aspect of muons, what would be your favorite thing? My favorite thing is something we didn't even mention, (laughs) which is that you can switch out an electron 
and switch in a muon to make a different type of atom. So you take your atom no with your way. Your electron. Don't believe you. No way. Out- <laughs> well, it doesn't last for very long because, like we said, the muons decay. But you can do that, and you can make a different type of atom, which is pretty cool. Is there an example of, of how that would... I mean, it, it's not like this is something you do in a lab. It's not like a kush ball from China has muon atoms instead of... <laughs> Like, this is something you do in a lab in a controlled way, and it doesn't last for very long. So it's not that useful, but it's still kind of cool that you can do it. Well, it doesn't have to be useful, but I'm just curious what, you know, like, what would, say, if you were going to change an electron in an atom of argon? I don't know that we've done it. I I honestly don't know whether we've done it for more than hydrogen and helium. Um, So what's different about it is just that the atom is heavier because like we mentioned before, the muon is heavier than the electron. So if you switch out an electron for a muon, you get more mass in your atom. So your atom would be heavier. It would be obviously more unstable. Yeah, the electron orbitals change position, right? Yeah, it would be smaller, right? Yeah, the the mass of the orbiting uh, particle is much higher and it's got more inertia and so it'll cuddle up a lot closer to the uh, nucleus. Is there a special name for an atom, like a hydrogen with a muon? It's muonium. Uh, really? No, muon? it isn't. No, it's not. Muonium is uh, an atom, it's an anti-muon and an electron. Oh, wow, yeah. So they replaced the proton <laughs> with an anti-muon. Just- wow. Okay. Uh, Ryan, what's your favorite thing about muons? Uh, actually, I dislike muons because uh, <laughs> the experiments I work on are very complicated because we try to avoid muons. So we do our experiments in a deep underground mines. So we go through a lot of effort to get away from these muons. <laughs> Wait, are you part of those experiments that are trying to isolate particles that are time particles, I think? And they have this very deep underground with like distilled water and they're trying to just find the one particle that can pass through. Yeah, the... that's exactly it. So what we're looking for you? Um, is dark matter. Yeah. <gasps> that's so cool. Yeah, it's pretty neat. So I do experiments in deep underground mines. And it's cool oh because the, the mines are like super dirty, right? Because they're mines. <laughs> but then, you know, a mile and a half underground, we'll have like these ultra clean lab where you have like a clean room and a clean suit. This is, I always think it's kind of like a James Bond laird where you're, you know, this hidden super modern space in a super dirty mine. So it's, it's quite cool for yeah. sure. That is so metal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we'll go to the Titanium Physics website and look up Dark Matter. We've done several episodes on them, but we haven't on Dark Matter detection too much because we haven't detected anything yet. Wah, wah. <laughs> okay. My favorite thing about muons is muon tomography. There's this really crazy thing they did at uh, Super Cameo Candy. Super Cameo Candy is a, a neutrino experiment just like Ryan works on. Or rather, Ryan's working on a dark matter experiment. But essentially, uh, neutrino experiments involve the same thing. They're big tanks of water where they're looking for neutrinos coming in, bouncing off some water, making a little bit of light. That's essentially these detectors. So there's one in the middle of a mine, in the middle of a mountain in Japan. And the idea was that this mountain would shield the detector from cosmic rays, muons, they still get stray muons in. And the deal is that they, they've they been detecting muons all over the place. New, muons are noise in this case because they're looking for neutrinos, which have a much subtler signal. Anyway, so this group took all of the muon data and used it to figure out the topography of the mountain above them. And so they made a 3D map of what the mountain above them must look like based on these muon trails. It's great. Anyway, I think that's my favorite thing. It's bananas. That is so cool. All of those things are awesome. Okay, everybody, that was absolutely fantastic. We learned so much about muons. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Diana. You've pleased me. Your efforts are born fruit, and that fruit is sweet. Here is some fruit. Ryan, you get a grape. Oh, wow. (laughs) Sorry, I choked on the grape. (laughs) Uh, Diana, you get plum. Oh, nom, nom, nom. All right. I appreciate like to... that you want people to make eating sounds on your podcast, and eating sounds are notoriously the grossest sounds. I'm very stupid. <laughs> All right, I'd like to thank my guest, Sarah Gailey, author of River of Teeth, her first novella. It's available now on Amazon for pre-order. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. This was so much fun. You guys are great. Hello, everybody. So, 
it's time to wrap up the episode. This episode was pretty fun, and boy, was it a lot of work to edit it. But I'm pretty happy about how it came out. So announcement time. First off, please give us an iTunes review or tell other people about us online. Why? Because people keep their love of physics hidden deep down in their hearts. And so if you tell them that you like physics, and there's the show you like to listen to, maybe they'll give us a listen. All right, so the best way for them to find out about our show is randomly tripping over us on iTunes. And the best way to climb to the top of the iTunes charts is to get iTunes reviews. Uh, Another fun announcement is that for the month of January, we'll be selling our T-shirts on the Teespring website. You can find a link to it off the main page of our website. Just go to the right and click Store. Um, We're going to be re-releasing all of the different classic titanium physicist t-shirt designs so if you'd like one the sale will close at the end of january and then teespring does this thing where they need to sell a a minimum number to print any of them so anyway we're gonna sell them for super cheap just for fun okay on another note we're still humbly soliciting your donations your donations go to paying our server fees and our project to transcribe episodes and to buy our physicists' new, better-sounding microphones. Thanks to your support, we've already transcribed our entire back catalog, and so the money you give us will go to our Improve Audio Quality project. You can send one-time donations through PayPal off of our website, or you can go to our sweet Patreon page and give us a recurring $2 donation. Speaking of which, this particular episode of The Titanium Physicist has been sponsored by a collection of generous people. I'd like to thank the generosity of Carl Nagel, Adam Rabung, Louise Pantanella for their donations. I'd also like to thank Alex, WTL, Mr. Per Proden, Andrew Waddington, Mr. Jordan Young, and John Blies, a Brittany Crooks, James Crawford, Mr. Mark Simon, Tucson's Gang of One, Mr. Lawrence Lee, Sixton Linuson, Lawrence Lee, Mr. Simon, Keegan Ede, Adrian Schoenig, Andreas from Knoxville, Cadby, Joe Campbell, Alexandra Zani is great, Wina Brett, Eric's Dutch, Etienne, and a gentleman named Peter Fan, Gareth Easton, Joe Piston, David Johnson, and Anthony Leon, as well as Doug B., Julia, Noel Robertson, Ian, and Stu, a Mr. Frank, Philip from Austria, and Noisy Mime, Mr. Shlomo Dalal, Melissa Burke, Yassine Uwarzazi, Spider Rogue, Insanity Orbits, Rodman Johnson, Madame Sandra Johnson, Mr. Jacob Wick, Mr. John Keyes, a Mr. Victor C., Ryan Kloss, Peter Clipsham, Mr. Robert Halpin, Elizabeth and Teresa, and Paul Carr, a Mr. Ryan Newell, Mr. Adam K., Thomas Shai Ray, and Mr. Jacob S., a gentleman named Brett Evans, a lady named Jill, a gentleman named Greg, thanks Steve, Mr. James Clausen, Mr. Devin North, a gentleman named Scott, Ed Lowlington, Kelly Wienersmith, Jocelyn Reed, a Mr. S. Hatcher, Mr. Rob Abrazado, and Mr. Robert Stietka. So that's it for Titanium Physicists this time. Remember that if you like listening to scientists talk about science in their own words, there are lots of other lovely shows on the Brachial Media Network. Also, on this particular episode of the Titanium Physicist podcast, my friend Tim Dobbs came to our rescue when the raw audio sounded literally like broken glass. Thank you, Tim Dobbs, for audio engineering the heck out of this episode. Tim has his own podcast called Encyclopedia Brunch, where facts and trivia are discussed every week, and it's one of my favorites. The intro song to our show is by Ted Leo and the Pharmacist, and the end song is by John Vanderslice. Good day, my friends, and until next time, remember to keep science in your hearts. gotta tell you dear before you come back here I lost I lost your bunny I let him out of the cage he was eating spring mix on the carpet jumped through a window out into the haze hop down magnolia Uh, Sir, do you have any questions before before we 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 really get get rolling?
Um, I think my only question is, is it okay if I laugh every time you say muon? Yes, you can. <laughs> what, I'm curious, what is it about muon that makes you laugh? First of all, I was expecting from only ever having seen it written that it was going to be pronounced muon, and I had a lot of cow jokes at the ready that I'm not going to get to use. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is so sad. I know. It's a deep disappointment that I'm going to carry to my grave. Are you utterly um, disappointed? <laughs> Seems like a lot of bull to me. Okay. All right. Get out of here. <laughs> I do I do like the interpretation muon for the pronunciation of this word. It is a muon. Have you um the first part is mu like the Greek letter mu. Um, right, right, right. So well, obviously uh, know about greek letters of come on <laughs> <laughs> this is what this is one thing that physicists do a lot is they name things with greek letters so muon is no exception um okay moral story they're little particles they look like electrons are super heavy they eventually they're break. not technically dense they're not technically they're dense a- they decay oh brilliant and they decay into electrons and some other junk. And they don't or, decay in a way that I think is clever to refer to them as decaying. They decay in that other way. Yeah, because they're not made of stuff. They just spontaneously turn into other stuff. Like how a zombie can spontaneously turn into two frogs and a vampire. <laughs> it's way better. I have a question, okay, Sarah, I'll for you. Frogs, but I just, how dare you say that a zombie could decay into a vampire? I'm so I'm embarrassed for you. <laughs> Does, do is, do I have that backwards? Do vampires decay into zombies? That makes more sense. Maybe I a vampire turns, decays into two... <laughs> that would be a whole other podcast. You <laughs> Maybe a vampire to... decays into a zombie you and can't... an ugly dog. You can't begin to explain? Does that mean we broke the writer? I, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it doesn't take a lot to break a writer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I have a question for you, Sarah. When is the first time you heard of muons? When a gentleman, I'll never forget it. It was this amazing moment in my scientific (laughs) education. A gentleman by the name of Benjamin Tippett uh, (laughs) sent me a message on a website that you may remember. It's called Twitter. It, you know, you might, it might be from like too long ago, but he sent it to me and he said, Hey, do you want to come on this podcast that I'm doing and a podcast is like a radio show but for the internet and he said we're going to talk about muons and that was the first time I ever heard about them I'll never forget the day Ugh, it feels like it was just yesterday feels like it was just <laughs> two microseconds ago <laughs> <laughs> not that uh, long ago okay, so <laughs> <laughs> nothing so long in your life um okay so so like I'm curious though having discovered recently in your life that there's this whole world, a zoo, as they like to say, of particles, is your mind blown? I feel like yes is the satisfying answer. I know, right? Um, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I've been aware of and uneducated in particle physics for a long time, and my husband is actually a physics teacher at the high school level. So I tend to do a lot of listening to explanations of physics concepts um, that have included, you know, brief references to particle physics that I have listened to very uh, attentively as I do with everything that my husband explains to me. And I'm saying that on the record. (laughs) (laughs) I will not delete you saying that. It is always exciting to learn about new aspects of the field, especially if there's the possibility that he doesn't yet know about them and I can go and sound super smart to him. Oh, yes. Always. I'm excited to get to be talking about what is something about muons that you hate having to try to explain? Lepton conservation. No. <laughs> Lepton number conservation. Ugh. Did you hear that? Gross. <laughs> the disgust in your voice. I don't know why I signed myself up to do that uh, explanation. I'm like, oh, I don't know. There's these numbers. They're abstract. Uh, somehow they get conserved. Ryan, what do you hate about muons? Uh, I think that one was probably the tougher one. No. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, what you got? I don't like having to explain 
why we call things what we call them. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's so many words in physics that are ridiculous. Yep. We did a we did a show once on pasta matter. Uh, because oh, the uh, the matter inside of neutron stars uh, is named after different types of pasta. Do you so mean spaghetti do you mean, matter? Do you mean pasta? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pasta. Oh, yeah. Americans don't say it. Don't know what to say. Oh, pasta. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> See. I was like, pa- pasta? What? Pasta. Benjamin, are you Canadian? Yes. Ah, oh, I finally did it. My Henry Higgins moment. It was very. It was a good deduction. I'm very impressed. <laughs> Zero work. Yeah. You said sorry like an hour and a half ago. Well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what do you call the macaroni and cheese that comes in a blue box? Uh, that's craft dinner. You want you? That's craft dinner you're talking about. It's craft dinner. American yes. friends. It's craft dinner. That's the world he lives in. <laughs> 